everyone, my name is Laura and this is Aeroclass Expert Talks. We usually thank pilots for bringing us safely to our destinations, but it also takes a lot of hard work, accurate planning and accomplishment of maintenance tasks to keep these flying machines in the airworthy and safe conditions. All of this is achieved with the support of people who are indeed the real backbone of the aviation industry, aircraft maintenance engineers. So if you ever wondered what is needed for someone to be able to call themselves an aircraft engineer, today is the day you get your answers. My guest today is a licensed aircraft engineer, head of training at Storm Aviation and Ara class instructor, Ben Greenaway. Thanks, Ben, for joining me. My pleasure. So in the usual expert talk fashion, we're going to talk about your experience, Ben, just to get our viewers, uh, you know, get a glimpse of who you are and who you were before you came to this position as an Ara class instructor. So let's get right into it. And can you please tell me and our viewers what motivated you to pursue a career in this industry? Uh, well, you know, as a child, I was always interested in aircraft and uh, helicopters, planes, et cetera, et cetera. And we used to live in uh, West London, very close to uh, Heathrow Airport. So I often used to look up and see the aircraft taking off and landing. Uh, plus my older brother is a bit of an aviation geek like myself. So he often used to be at the end of the runway with his camera taking photos. And uh, he used to take me to air shows as well in the UK. So we'd go and see military aircraft taking on and off. I was always very partial to watching the Red Arrows and they're the Royal Air Force's aerobatic old display team and seeing them whoosh backwards and forwards. It always used to be quite magical as a young child. And uh, I suppose it just developed from there. And uh, obviously you kind of, you know, found the passion in there, but did it stay or did it actually grew once you joined like your first role in aviation? Um, I think to begin with, I'll be absolutely honest with you, I think to begin with there was a little bit of a bump because I didn't know what to expect. I thought it was going to be very, very glamorous and you get thrown straight in on working on aircraft with tooling and getting very, very in-depth to technical things. And obviously, as a very junior apprentice, you have to start at the bottom. Like everywhere else, you have to work your way up, don't you? So to begin with, we spent a year in the classroom. We did a lot of technical stuff on. And to be honest with you, some of the equipment you use for training quite often is retired and slightly old and not always cutting edge. So the first year was a little bit, I wouldn't say a disappointment, but it wasn't quite the dreamy heights I was expecting. But as the experience and you know technical skill grew then you get more and more involved and then you start getting to a point where basically you know the entire aircraft and they let you that's probably the wrong thing to say you are you're experienced and qualified enough to be maintaining all of those systems and getting involved and that's when it gets really really interesting i see so it takes time oh absolutely absolutely and unfortunately when you are a bit younger you know, uh, patience is a life skill, as they say, and it's something that everybody needs to learn. I see. So in your career, of course, you had different roles. Um, is there anything that really stands out for you or something that you wish to do all over again? Um, well, when I was uh, in the training department at uh, British Airways, I was there for five years and I enjoyed that immensely. Very, very enjoyable. Great place to work. And uh, I was actually part of the entry into service uh, project for British Airways' Airbus' A380s, the super jumbos. And it's, uh, it's a lot more complex than just buying an aircraft and putting it into service. There's many, many parts of this. And our small section in the training department was becoming authorised to deliver the training on that particular type. So a training school cannot just pick up a set of books and a set of notes and start teaching any type. You can't just start teaching an Airbus or a Boeing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need to be approved, and there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be done. A lot of uh, organisations discussions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we were, did a lot of work with Airbus and also the UK CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority, to gain that approval so that we could teach uh, British Airways its engineers how to maintain and fix the A380. And that, that, was a, that was a great project to be involved in, absolutely fantastic. Sounds definitely interesting. Uh, but do you think that um, for young people who want to join in this industry, you know, and like assignments like that, could that be the turning point, whether, you know, they're 
not quite into it can be that breaking point because I know that you know challenges and particular bumps in the road as you said at the beginning can be quite daunting and some people you know turn away from the industry at that point I but, think you know I think you're absolutely right Laura I think sometimes you know people come across a hurdle or an issue and it, it basically is sours you it's almost like um going to your favorite restaurant and, and having a meal that you don't enjoy you know and sometimes you just have to put that down to experience you have to think to yourself you know I, i've done this many many times before i've been happy with all the other times i've been doing these projects with engineering or with aircraft i've been very very happy and this one time i'm doing something that's maybe outside my comfort zone something i'm not 100 happy with the the enjoyment factor is lowered a little bit but you have to suck it in basically you have to say you know this is it's it's called work for a reason and sometimes you have to do things that you don't necessarily enjoy doing okay but you look at the bigger picture okay i always like when i'm when i'm talking to some of our apprentices and the younger guys i always liken it like it to professional uh, sports stars you know they they play the match maybe once or twice uh, a week but every single day they're training every single day they're in the gym or they're they're discussing tactics and they're looking at the opposition those parts of the job that's not the game that's not the match that's not the competitive edge that they enjoy and it's very very much like that in every single vocation every single job there's that there's that match day point that you absolutely love but there's other bits that you don't like as much but they're necessary they because it's part of the overall package and that's, that's I like what that metaphor. Say, that's what I've got to say to younger guys and girls out there you know you just have to remember you know there's no perfect job okay every job has the fun part that you want to talk about at parties and be proud of and there's the other parts you know the cleaning up after the party yeah taking the taking the rubbish out every job has those parts yeah that makes sense uh but is there anything that is needed then in terms of char uh, characteristics because uh, you mentioned patience already and of course you know resilience i guess is one of the biggest things is there anything else needed for someone to succeed in this industry especially in your role i've got to say in aviation but this is i would say this is true of virtually anything else as well it's about passion okay when you're interested in something and you have passion for it you will do it again and again and again okay when you're younger these passions can be a little bit um misguided you know you see children playing with the same toys again and again and again or watching the same cartoons again and again and again because they're passionate and it interests them okay everybody has their niche everybody has their section i'm an aircraft geek i love airplanes <laughs> you know so it's just magical to me i'm like a child on the inside and that's why sometimes i start reading uh, technical documentation or i'm learning about a new system there's there's modifications going on the whole time i'm like wow that's that's new that's interesting and before i know it half an hour has passed and i thought i was reading for 10 seconds and it's just because i've become engrossed in the subject matter and my brain is just tick 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 record 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 the red light is on yeah other things in my life unfortunately and you can speak to my wife about this if you like some things not so interested not so passionate about i don't listen the whole time okay but the uh, the lesson of all this to anybody whether you're interested in aviation or not if you're passionate and you enjoy this stuff yes it'll make it stick and and you'll be good if you're trying to force yourself to do something and 80% of the time you're not interested that's not enough it's not enough you need to be engaged 80% of the time yes you will not be engaged the whole time like we said previously there's always going to be some of those taking out the trash or taking out the rubbish jobs which are necessary on all roles all roles have those okay but the 80% of the job you should love and that will focus you and that will give you that passion and and it is so true in aviation but I think uh, you know you've got so much love for this industry that I guess it kind of brought you to another part of your job, which is teaching, because you want to share that love with everyone else, right? Can you tell us about your very first teaching experience? Why did you even consider this move? It goes back. I know this sounds strange. I, I used to work on the Concorde, and I'm very, very proud of this. And, and obviously, the Concorde was a very, very 
uh, prestigious aircraft and we used to get a lot of visitors on the hangar and for some reason i'm not even quite sure how this happened but we had like a little pamphlet that we'd give out to visitors it was just like a photocopied five or six sheet piece of paper talking about the the top speed the characteristics the fuel load you know spe special technical aspects and then just one time our uh, our shift manager said oh can somebody show these guys around and i showed these people around as as normal and i was talking about the concord and i was talking about this and talking about that and then somebody said oh yeah you know your engineers really know this stuff and then by default i seem to become the once a month general guy who would show visitors around the Concorde, yeah, just as an unofficial little 20 minute walk around the aircraft when it was in the hangar. And when I did this and, and I didn't even think about it. And then we were, we, I was a trainee on a few courses. I got friend, you know, we do a lot of courses when I was at British Airways. And when I was a trainee, I got friendly with some of the instructors there because it's quite a tight knit. And there was a guy there called Paul and he said, you know, I think you'd make a good instructor. You know, you've got a good way of expressing yourself and metaphors and analogies. And so I went for a job and I got it. And I thought, you know, instructing, there's nothing to it. I'm quite technically strong. It should be fine. Uh, but my first proper uh, teaching was to about 30 guys in a room and we used to do continuation training. And this is where every two years the engineers get brought back into the organization to make sure they have recurrent knowledge on important factors and there's a there's a fixed syllabus and all engineering companies uh follow more or less this uh, syllabus and i thought you know i've been on this course i know this and there's a big difference between knowing it here in your head and delivering it because when you're an instructor even now you find yourself listening to your voice and you're concentrating on what you're saying as well so it's almost as though you're doing two jobs if you're doing two jobs at once you're talking and listening and listening to your feedback you throw in complex technical or procedural things as well and then you are your mind is racing and it, it's a skill it is a skill luckily i've got it okay and i've been managed to polish it and refine it it's not for everybody but I enjoy it. I enjoy helping people. I, I like it when people give me feedback. Sometimes I've got bad feedback. You know, I've not, not all my courses have been great. Some of the early ones were very, very poor. I'll be honest with you by my standards now. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a skill, it is a skill. But this first time was very, very difficult because you're delivering recurrent training that everybody already knows. And this is to your peers. And I'd, I'd been in the industry at this point about 20 years. But of course, you know, you know, I was I was in my early 30s and um, there's there's guys there in their 50s and 60s. You know, these guys had been working on aircraft before I was born and you've got 30 of these guys in a room. You have got hundreds of years of experience. And the mistake I really made is I didn't respect the experience. You know, it's 20 years versus maybe 400 and um if you don't respect the class things go south very quickly and unfortunately on my first few courses i learned this the hard way yes so if anybody is in uh engineering and you're thinking about going into instructing you know you have to remember that you might know a lot but you are never going to beat the class because those guys out there have your knowledge as a group if that makes sense and you have yeah. to respect you have to respect the class. Absolutely, yeah. But now uh, you made a course for our class together with our sister companies, FL Technics and Storm Aviation. And it must have been a bit different then, you know, standing in front of a green screen, kind of just speaking to a camera rather than just seeing everybody's faces. Was that different, better? or maybe even harder? Um, I've, I've done a couple of videos, but they've all, always been almost like a, um, a live uh, time around you around the aircraft and they've been in, I, I know this sounds strange, when when you're doing technical videos and you're standing by the engine, the the components on the engine are like your aid memoir, they're like your script. You know, you look over, you see the generator, you see the oil pump, they're quite easy. When you're standing in front of the green screen and you just have, a, a set of words in front of you, you had the teleprompter. It's very, very difficult. I, I found it very, very difficult. And uh, I'll be honest with you, there were a lot of cut, 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 retake. We'll try that again. Um, you know, it, it got easier as the, the day went on. I did find it particularly uh, um, strange because it was uh, during the time when not everybody could travel. 
And so the, the support that we had from air class, it's, it's not disrespectful, it was remote. So we were doing it in this green screen room and we had several laptops uh, set up and on the laptops were the aero class uh, specialists, the support team, giving me support from a thousand miles away, which was strange because obviously in, in the past when I've done these sort of videos, the director and the supporting director, et cetera, et cetera, the sound man, et cetera, have all been next to me to give me that, that support where it was just me and the cameraman basically in a green room. So it, it was strange, it was strange. But hopefully you and everyone else at Aero Class and the rest of our viewers uh, like the finished product. I'm very proud of it. A lot of effort went to it, uh, a lot of effort went to it. And uh, hopefully the uh, next generation can see that and they'll, they'll learn some good stuff from it. So let's talk about it. Can you please tell us a bit more about the course, what it covers and who should maybe, you know, get their time and just sit down and watch it? Well, the, the course is really aimed at uh, anybody who needs to know more about how to become a licensed aircraft engineer. So this could be young people or even mechanics and technicians who have been in the industry for a while. They're established at a certain level and they want to progress. They want to move up to that licensed aircraft engineer position. You know, what do they need to do? What do they need? Where, what are the regulations? Where do they go? Where do they need to start? In many cases, a lot of these people are already on the journey. They just don't realize it. Okay. These people have some of the skills and definitely the experience that you can take into account to gain the license. They just don't know how far along on the journey they are. It's also really, really good, I think, for a lot of support staff. So in many, many cases, you know, like an engineering organization, a uh, maintenance repair organization has many, many different roles. We get people in from different industries and they don't quite understand the role of the licensed aircraft engineer or the regulations that are necessary, the ones that we have to comply with to get those positions and how it works when maintaining aircraft to keep aircraft serviceable. And so it's quite important that, you know, these roles take it as well. So any support roles in the compliance and safety departments, for example, you know, quality, et cetera, et cetera. These are the sort of people, if they don't quite understand the the role of the LAE and what they need with regards to a part 145 maintenance repair organization of course is ideal and i know uh especially for me since i'm in no way related to that field it might seem a bit so how do you become an aircraft engineer like do you need to start from school like you do you need to be into physics do you need to be into a particular subject to you know approach that career what do you think is the is there only one way or can it be you know different situations for everyone there's there's several there's several different ways of uh, of doing this you know there's some people who basically will go to a uh, an approved school okay so you'll go back to what's known as a part 147 mm -hmm. maintenance training organization now part 147s are actually have two parts to them they there's, there's the parts are the parts are parted if you will. So 147, first of all, some 147 training schools will offer you what's known as a basic course. And this will be a few years in duration. And basically in this basic course, you will have basically competence in the fact that you will uh, pass your exams, you will get knowledge. So they will teach you about the basics of aircraft systems, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll pass exams to get the knowledge. And also they will offer you experience. And once you've got the required experience working on aircraft systems, parts, landing gear, engines, et cetera, et cetera, then you can get your license. Now that's not the end of the story because to become a proper licensed aircraft engineer, you also need to do specific type training. So that's the second part of the 147. The 147 also gives you type training. If you want to think of it like a driving license, Laura, okay, at the moment you get a driving license and it allows you to drive any car. Well, it's not the same for fixing aircraft. The driving license needs the specific car model that you're going to be driving. So you would do a basic driving test so you understand what a wheel is, how an engine works, etc., etc. And then if you want to drive a Ferrari, you have to go and do training on driving a Ferrari and your license will say Ferrari on it, I can drive a Ferrari. If your friend has a Porsche though, you can't drive it. Not until you do the training on the Porsche. That's, how, that's basically how it works. And that's the two parts of the 147. 
Now, I did say the first part is very much along the lines where it's an organized course, but you don't have to do it like that if you want to. If you want, you can do it more or less like self-study. So for the knowledge, you can sit at home with the books, you can study, and then you would go to an exam uh, station or exam center, and you would just basically verify the knowledge by passing the exams. And for the experience, you don't need to do that under the control of a 147. You can just do that in a normal part 145 maintenance repair organization, basically in the, the hangar environment get your experience on changing aircraft components, doing troubleshooting, performing repairs on systems and the skin and things like this. I see, and there are a lot of numbers, one, four, seven, two, five, five. It's quite, you know, when you don't know what's happening, it's quite confusing, but as I understand, there are different licenses as well, right? So... Oh yeah, there's there's basically, they, they break the licenses down into different categories as well, depending on the aircraft type and also the complexity. So what we see here is just as very, very basically, you know, if you want to go and work on a helicopter, you get a helicopter license, okay? If you want to go and work on a, an aircraft with uh, turbine engines, you go and get a turbine engine license. That's how this works as well. Also, it's subdivided into licenses such as avionics. So there's a, there's a general license which covers all the computers and electrics on all types of aircraft, whether it's a fixed wing or a rotary as well. And also they've, they're all also adding licenses the whole time. So we basically look at having categories of license for smaller, less complex aircraft. Okay, so, so basically for say unpressurized four seat piston aircraft engine, there'd be different licenses for these. Okay, and obviously as the aircraft becomes simpler, there's actually less study to do. But from a certification point of view, if you've got a license on a helicopter, you can't go and work on an Airbus A380 and certify on that because you need to have the basic category correct for the type of aircraft you're going to be working on. I see. Again, with the driving license uh, analogy, you can think a lot of people have a license that allows them to say drive a, a normal car, but they can't get in a truck. That's a separate addition. They have to take an additional test to go and work, to go and drive a truck. A truck. And it's a similar analogy, okay? You, you know, you have different types of license for different categories of vehicle. In aircraft maintenance, you have different categories of license for different types of aircraft. So it can be a bit overwhelming, but I'm sure there are people that are still, you know, very much interested in this role. But uh, I wanna ask you as a trainer, because. I'm sure you see, you know, what's happening in the industry at the moment. And we know that after the COVID pandemic, a lot of people were laid off. And now since the demand is coming back, we're struggling with finding the specialists to do the job. What is the situation with aircraft maintenance engineers? Do we have um, enough people or do we see the lack of them out there? Uh, with, with aircraft engineering, obviously what we've seen is we've seen a, a basically a two year hiatus where training and recruitment has stopped so you've got that gap there but it, it's more than that not only have we not been training but i think a lot of people reassessed their um their work-life balance so you know obviously with other movements in the last uh, few years where people have not been having set retirement dates and things like this people have been working longer i think a lot of people have taken retirements so they've left the uh, industry we've had this huge rebound this year where we've had this pent up demand where people want to go in on holiday or go and see loved ones around the world. So that's been a real, real rush. Um, something else as well, obviously with airports being shut, people have uh, people migrated to different roles during the COVID pandemic. And of course, now that there are more opportunities, these people are migrating back. So you find some people were traveling a long distance to work, to work in aviation because of the reduced uh, opportunities. Now they're choosing to do the same role on the same money, but closer to home. So this is this this adds to the complex the complexity of the recruitment at the moment. But the bottom line is, we need people. We need people who are passionate. We need people who want to get involved, and people who understand that you know this is a serious industry. Okay, there's no mistakes at thirty thousand feet. Okay, you can't just pull the handbrake on and then wait for the repair trucks to turn up. It doesn't work like that. Okay, uh, the, the implications of everybody in aviation, whether you're actually directly working on the aircraft or your support staff like me doing the training, if you get it wrong, people get hurt. Uh, and it's important to remember that every single day. 
<laughs> that just took a turn now. Because <laughs> I just thought about it as well. I think at the same time, you know, you might be very interested in just kind of getting your hands on the, an aircraft and just doing your job. But at the same time, it holds a lot of pressure on you because you do one thing wrong and it could, you know, end in a very, very sad way, I guess. Now, now, Laura, just to reassure you before we go too dark on this, okay, obviously aviation is a mature industry. It's been going over 100 years and there have been a lot of mistakes in the past. But one thing that the aviation industry is very, very good at is improving and putting safeguards in place. One thing I do struggle with uh, sometimes with some of the younger guys and girls who are coming into the industry for the first time is, you know, we have a lot of duplication and sometimes even things are triplicated. There are lots of extra steps that need to be done. And these are normally as a result of an incident. So as an analogy, you could go to open your, uh, your door of your house and you find that you need four separate keys and you're like, why do I need four keys? I only need one. Why do I need four keys? And because we find that in the past there have been different incidents that have caused that door to fail and not be shut. So we add extra safeguards in place. I mean, for example, your car has one engine, doesn't it? Most aircraft have two. Yeah, do they need these two? Air like, why don't they just put one big air, one big engine on there? No, we have two for safety. Okay, and you'll find that most systems are duplicated triplicated and in some cases they have multiple backups as well and just going back to aircraft engineering this is one of the most important roles really of uh, aircraft engineers it's not just keeping aircraft safe but it's checking those safety systems that you only ever see on films you know so when you might if you've ever watched a, a maybe a, a film where the escape slide goes and everybody slides off the aircraft and things like that or the aircraft uh, lands on water and people have to put the life jackets on and things like this yeah it's the aircraft engineer that checks those and this is the difference when we have an incident between the aircraft maybe having an emergency landing and everybody getting off safely or people getting off injured or worse. And, it, and it's the responsibility of the aircraft engineer to check those backup, to check those safety systems, to make sure that when we need them, they work. And you know, talking about kind of checking things, can you separate your kind of work from when you travel for leisure? Do you, when you kind of board an airplane, you kind of look at all the things and you look through the window and you see what the guys are doing? Do you start to evaluate their work? Do you see what they're doing? And also, does that make it easier for you to travel? Or is it actually a bit more, you know, you know what might go wrong? Or like if you saw someone not do it quite well? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, does I, it make I, you I think, think about that? First of, first of all, first of all, obviously, you know that the windows on an aircraft aren't huge, are they? And also you're sitting quite high up. So to properly evaluate somebody uh, doing a job, okay, it's quite difficult, okay? But I will say whenever I fly, I do a pay, I pay attention to the systems, I pay attention to the noises, I watch what the cabin crew are doing, not in a bad way, but because I'm a geek, and I like aviation, as mentioned, I'm always watching these sort of things. I'm looking at the flight controls moving. I'm listening to the landing gear retract. I can hear the flaps retract as well, the motors running, things like this, you know. Uh, it, it just, it fascinates me. It fascinates me. Um, with regards to watching people work when I'm flying, I've never, ever seen, uh, you know, anything that's not been done 100%. Everything I've seen, when I, on the few occasions when there has been problems, I've always seen aircraft engineers doing things professionally and safely, not just for their own safety, but for the safety of everyone around them. Uh, because obviously we understand how, as a community, we understand the potential of making a mistake, or the, what that could lead to. So that's, that's it. I do have one little uh, pet hate for my uh, brothers and sisters in the community, and that's, um, that's dirty fingerprints on uh, cabin panels. So sometimes, you know, obviously it's a dirty job we do. Uh, aircraft engineers don't get the opportunity to wash their hands in the same manner that doctors and surgeons do. Maybe they should, I don't know, maybe they should. But sometimes they'll remove a panel in the cabin to get access to a, another component for testing or replacement or something like that. They replace the panel and you'll see, say a dirty mark on the ceiling. And I, I, just, I just think it doesn't portray the professionalism 
or, or the, the, the amount of respect that the trade requires. And I, I honestly think it would take nothing just to get a clean, clean cloth and just wipe, <laughs> wipe that mark off. And I think, I think people, it just, you know, if you, if you were, uh, if your car came back from the garage and you just spent a lot of money on an expensive um, uh, service and there were oily fingerprints on the seat or on the window, you, you would be thinking, have these, have these guys fixed my brakes properly? You know, have these guys put oil in the engine? And, and that's the sort of thing that people start thinking about. So for guys who are working on aircraft at the moment, that's my number one pet hate. Okay. Just keep a little washcloth, you know, just to wipe them out. It, it doesn't need to be super clean. We're not doing open heart surgery. It, all it needs is a quick wipe. That's all it needs. <laughs> okay. Just give it on. When you finish, give it a quick wipe. But you know, I have to say, if that is the kind of worst thing that you can say about what you've seen in your experience, I, I think we're pretty good. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, there's nothing too groundbreaking or too scary then. And I like it. Makes me feel Laura, better. Laura, because when if you watch the video and you see the amount of hoops that you have to um, jump through and the hurdles that have to be uh, jumped over to become a licensed aircraft engineer, you'll understand that there are people who don't get the certificates and they don't get the licenses unless they meet the criteria. Two, just to remind people though, if you are considering a, a career, if you've never failed an exam, there's something wrong with you. Everybody has a bad day. Okay, I myself have failed many, many exams, but you pick yourself up, you find out where you've gone wrong and you try again. Okay, you try again. But those exams and those tests, those assessments, they're very, very necessary because they show that you are at the required standard to keep yourself and other people safe when working in aviation. Beautiful. Well, thanks a lot for joining me, Ben. I love hearing, you know, about your experience and your thoughts about what's happening now in aircraft engineering world. Uh, I would love to ask you to kind of tell our viewers one thing why they should consider this as a career option, becoming an aircraft maintenance engineer. You you get to do something that makes a difference. Okay, you, you see the history of aircraft, you realize why certain systems are in place from the history, from incidents and accidents investigation, you understand how things work and you find that 99% of general people are so interested in aviation, maybe not quite geek level. Yeah, but when you say you're an aircraft engineer, people start listening. Okay, people say it's a great career. Okay, makes your parents very proud as well. They go to parties and they say, my son or my daughter's an aircraft engineer. It makes them very, very proud. You know, it's a great thing to do. Plus, aviation in general, any role in aviation, it's great to be involved in because it's international. I would, again, I'd say 99% of people love traveling, experiencing new things, seeing new cultures, and you get that opportunity. I've been so many places with work. I've been so many places on aircraft for pleasure as well, for holidays and other bits and pieces. And you just get a real understanding of how the world is the same, but different. You know, the, the internet age and this ability to talk to people like we are now on different video meetings, this is all relatively new but you still don't get to experience that touchy feeling sense of the world, which you do with air travel. And uh, the, the whole thing amazes me. And I'm, I'm just really lucky that I've had a, a long career with, with a few years to go yet uh, in aviation. And I would recommend it to anybody, not just engineering. I would recommend any roles in aviation. Yeah, all I hear is benefits, 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 win, 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 win. So that's lovely to hear, Ben. If you want to learn from Ben and become an aircraft engineer, you need some guidance, make sure you visit our webpage and check out his course that is done with FL Technics and Storm Aviation. So that's it for today. Thank you very much again, Jen, for joining me. And My pleasure. take care. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay, bye-bye.